Good morning and welcome to the Greater Philadelphia Church of Christ, our live stream uh, worship service. Uh, my name is Chip Mitchell and I serve as the lead evangelist of the Greater Philadelphia Church of Christ along with my wonderful and beautiful wife, Ruby Mitchell. I want to thank you for joining with us uh, this morning for our worship service. Um, welcome to 2021. I hope that uh, the beginning of your year has been absolutely fantastic. I do want to, again, thank all of our first responders, all of our frontline workers uh, who are out there serving in uh, heroic ways, really um, taking care of uh, our country in a time of great stress. And uh, uh, we can't thank you enough as uh, members and the leadership of the Greater Philadelphia Church for uh, your commitment uh, to serving. Thank you, and we pray that you as well as your family, will remain safe uh, during this difficult time. Well, welcome again, and we are making our way through the book of Mark, and I'm excited that uh, I get an opportunity to talk to you about Mark uh, chapter 9, beginning in verse uh, 42. Uh, this is a very interesting segment of uh, uh, the book of Mark. Jesus uh, jumps in and deals very strongly with uh, this idea of uh, followers of Christ or individuals hurting other individuals, that uh, somehow, some way, our actions, our behavior uh, would cause others to stumble and fall. And Jesus has some pretty severe and strong words uh, for those who do that. And when you think about it, Jesus is, is so loving, so giving, and caring, but yet why such a strong response about uh, our sinful behaviors uh, affecting others? Uh, why? Well, you know, when you look at uh, the history of the world, if you will, in Genesis, uh, it all begins. We see in the beginning of Genesis, we see these three relationships, man's relationship with God, the creator, and then we see man's relationship with creation. And then we see the third relationship, man's relationship with one another. And, and this harmony uh, that was established by God in the beginning was magnificent. It was beautiful. It was man's relationship with God, man's relationship with what God had created, and man's relationship with one another. And all of a sudden, something happened. Sin. A disobedient behavior towards God. And it led to chaos. It disrupted this beautiful harmony between man and God, man and creation, and man and one another. And it's been the downfall of man ever since the beginning, sin. And when you think about it, we go from this beautiful harmony to man's relationship with one another. And because of sin... Uh, that we act out on each other or causing each other to struggle, you name it, it, uh, it has caused great division, it has caused great hostility, uh, and it has wrecked, uh, in many ways, the world that we live in. When you think about our history from, you know, you can look at the biblical history from Genesis all the way through the New Testament, we see man's impact on one another. And it's a, it's a sad, sad tale. And then we see in the 1920s, we see the Armenian genocide, and we see uh, upward estimates of 1.8 million people killed because of man's hostility towards man. We see in the 1940s, the Holocaust, anywhere from 3 to 6 million Jews taken out because of man's hostility towards one another. We see in the 1970s, you, you look in Cambodia and look at all the terrible things and atrocities that happened there with an estimate of 3 million individuals killed because of man's hostility towards one another, how man treats one another. In the 1990s, we look at Rwanda, and so somewhere near 800,000 lives taken away because of man's hostility towards one another. And then we come into the 21st century, and you can look no far as Dufour and, and see, Darfur, and, and see that uh, it's still going on with estimates of 500,000 individuals killed because of man's hostility towards one another. And this is why, when you look in Mark chapter 9, 
Jesus takes such a strong stance on the impact of our relationship to one another. Many will think, well, this is harsh. Well, no, it's, it's harsh for good reason. From the days of the garden until now, man is destroying what God set up to be harmonious, peaceful, and loving. And so let's jump on into Mark chapter 9 and, and get a real glimpse at what Jesus is challenging us with. In Mark chapter 9, beginning in verse 42, he says, If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them if a large millstone were hung around their neck and they were thrown into the sea. This is, this is a strong statement. Jesus is saying, by hurting them and killing them, he says, but if you cause them to even stumble, here's a much better scenario for you to tie a millstone around your neck and to be thrown into the sea. Very strong statement. Verse 43, if your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than two hands to go into hell, where the fire never goes out. Verse 45, and if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life crippled than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell. My first point is pretty simple. Sin causes harm and brings consequences. Sin causes great harm, and it brings great consequences. You know, when you read in this text, the first thing he says, if your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. <laughs> you know, Jesus is getting uh, pretty specific here in three different areas. And the first one he says is, is your hand. And, you know, the bottom line, in the last year, we've been stuck in the house. And, and many times you could say, well, your hand, well, what does that do? Well, you could hit someone and try and harm them or... Uh, use a gun, you name it, uh, to harm. But we've been stuck in the home, and right now our hands are typing on keyboards. And they're sending out all kinds of messages. And Jesus says, look, let me tell you something. If your hand causes you to stumble, you need to cut it off. Well, why? Sin causes harm, and there's great consequences. You know, you hit that send button, you know, you ever type an email, and that email is uh, really speaking to uh, your heart and, and from your mind, and it's about to go out, and it's going to cause a stir, and, you, and there's a moment of pause before you hit that enter button or that send button. There's a, there's a moment of, uh, of reflection, and you're going, if I send this, it will now begin. Well, I think, you know, we've got to be really careful right now because we can publish anything we want. We can press send on anything we want. We can type anything we want with our hands and send it out. And Jesus is warning us in this text that, hey, the bottom line, if your hand causes you to sin, or better yet, he says, let me tell you something, if you cause somebody to stumble, then cut it off. Then end it. Because it's better for you to have a millstone tied around your neck than to be dumped in the sea. He's, you know, it, it, it wow, Jesus He's saying, guard yourself. Watch what you publish. Brothers and sisters, I know we all have strong opinions on many different areas. But we are not a social institution. We're not a United States institution. We are the kingdom of God. We are a reflection of Jesus Christ. The Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, indwells in each of us who calls ourselves disciples. That simply means that we are a reflection of the face of God. And brothers and sisters, we have to be mindful of what we reflect in any setting, on any act, in any situation, in any environment. And God has called us to be holy amongst the nations. Notice he says, be holy amongst the nations. Why? Because the nations are not 
holy. They're not righteous. They're not godly. They have no reverence for God. But as for Christians, this is who we are. We are holy. And Jesus says here in Mark chapter 9, let me tell you something. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Why is Jesus so strong on this? Because our actions, our behavior, our speech, it matters. It will cause folks to find joy, peace, and godliness, or it will cause people to have division, suffering, and sheer madness in the world that we live in. Jesus says here, if you cause someone to struggle, to stumble, it's better for you to be dumped in the sea. He says, if, if you can't stop yourself from pressing sin, cut your hand off. Jesus wants us to deal radically with any of our sinful behavior, with behavior that will cause anyone to stumble. He says, you need to deal with it. And he lays it out here in Luke, or Mark chapter 9. The second thing he talks about is our feet. You know, in Romans it talks about their feet are swift to shed blood and destruction and misery are in their past. What is he talking about? We, we're so fast to rush to judgment. You know, this, this idea of rushing to judgment. You know, we see something, boom, we jump to it. Or a wind of teaching that comes along, we run along with it. Our feet are quick to shed blood. Or something that leads to destruction. We are so quick to judge, so fast to hold strong uh, to judgments. And Jesus says, if you can't handle this, cut your foot off. It's better to go into heaven crippled or lame than to go in both feet. Jesus deals strongly with the actions of those who follow him and their effect on others. Why? Look at the world we live in. Look at it. I mean, just turn any radio station on, turn any TV station on, any news network, and you will see the world that we live in. And boy, it's so tempting to jump on in that cesspool of sin, that cesspool of worldly ideology that has no bearing on eternity. We've been called to be holy. We've been called to imitate God, to be imitators of God. Jesus says, stop rushing to judgment. If your feet cause you to sin, then cut them off. Slow down. Third thing he talks about is if your eye causes you to sin, do what? Gouge it out. Now, what's the eye? Well, that's our perspective, right? I love this cartoon capture. <laughs> caption, rather. It says, you know, perspective matters. you got two guys. One is stranded on an island. The other one's stranded in a boat in the middle of the ocean. One sees land. The other sees a boat. And they're both rejoicing. <laughs> Little do they know they're both stranded. They're both lost. <laughs> you know, but yet they're, they're so excited. I see land! Oh, boat! You know, our perspective is just that. It's ours. We are no beacon of truth. You know, we're just a bastion of human, human desires that are tossed by every which way. Sinful behaviors that are within us constantly trying to influence our perspective. You know, and Jesus says, you know, what, what are you doing? What, 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 what are you doing? We're so bold in our thoughts. And Jesus says, your perspective, your eye, how do you view the world? He says, you need to be careful. Because if it affects folks and causes them to stumble, you're in trouble. And he says, if your perspective causes you to sin, he says, get rid of your perspective. It's not of greater value than your eternal destiny. That's what he's saying here. 
He says, don't allow your perspective to supersede or to trump your eternal destiny. He says, gouge it out. Pretty, pretty strong words. Why? Because sin causes great harm. Not only does it cause great harm, there are great consequences. Watch what he says. You know, the latter part of verse 47, we get into verse 48, he says, um, he says, where the worm, he, t he talks about those who don't cut off their hands or gouge out their eyes or their feet when they're causing them to sin. He says, what will happen? Well, they will be tossed into hell, thrown into hell. Verse 48 says, where the worm that eat them do not die. And the fire is not quenched. Jesus pictures, paints this picture, this graphic picture of destruction. Where the worms, they, they, they do not die. And, and the fire is never quenched. You know, he paints this hideous picture of those that do not deal with sin. Here's where you will end up. There are consequences. Well, where, where is he getting this from? Where, it's a quote from Isaiah. It's a quote from Isaiah 66. You know, this is the last chapter, if you will, of Isaiah's prophecy. And he's prophesying in a time of a divided kingdom, a, a world where the people of God were following idols, a world where the people of God were at odds with one another. They were at odds with one another. There were two separate political structures. And they were at odds with two different kings, two different lords, if you will. And Isaiah is writing and he's warning them throughout the book of Isaiah about where they're going, what is going to happen, and God's perspective. And here he writes in the last chapter, Isaiah 66, listen to what he says. And this is where Jesus is quoting from. He says in verse 15, he says, see, the Lord is coming. With what? With fire. That simply means judgment. You know, it's so easy to think we're the beacon of judgment. You know, when we get into these debates with one another and those that do not even know God. And Isaiah says, see, the Lord is coming with fire. And his chariots are like a whirlwind. He will bring down his anger with what? Fury. You see why Jesus was so strong in his words. This is where he's quoting from. And he says he will bring, he will, uh, bring down his anger with fury and his rebuke with what? Flames for fire. Of fire. For with fire and with his sword, what will happen? The Lord will execute judgment on who? All people. And many will be those slain by the Lord. <laughs> this is a scary moment. You know, you read Luke 9 and, and you can say, well, he really doesn't mean that. Well, this is where he's quoting from. And he's speaking about the judgment of God. And, you know, a lot of times, sometimes we, we feel motivated because we think people are going to try and get away with something. That people are getting away with uh, sinful behavior, sinful actions. And Isaiah is saying, no, the Lord will come. He's going to come swiftly with a whirlwind of fire and bring judgment on all people. You know, a lot of times, you know, in my role as a minister, people will come to me and ask me about, you know, the political environment and thoughts on that. And, and, you know, I have my own personal thoughts on different things, but the truth of the matter, it really doesn't matter. Um, the truth is that all men will fall before the judgment seat of Christ. And, you know, um, God is going to judge our heart. He's going to judge our actions and our, our, our mindset and God will judge justly. And here's the deal. If you don't have the blood of Christ, at God's judgment, he's going to beat you with many blows and then execute you and cast you out into the lake of fire. 
That, that's just what, that's what's going to happen. So what I feel in my perspective in the midst of eternity, you know what? It's going to be, you better get your life right with God. You better get your life right with God. Because when all this is said and done, God will bring me to account. And he will judge me. And the only thing I'm going to care about, it's not that I'm right or wrong about political or social issues. The only thing I'm going to care about is do I have the blood of Jesus Christ? Do I have the blood that was lavished on me and has forgiven me of all my derelictal actions in my life? That's the only thing that's really going to matter to me. See, because Isaiah says, let me tell you something. God is going to ex execute judgment on all people. And then watch what he says here in 17. He says, those who consecrate and purify themselves to go into the garden. So in other words, Isaiah is saying, look, and for those that have consecrated themselves, those that have decided to ascribe to godly principles, those who have ascribed to be purified by God, and to do what? And to enter into God's garden. See, we were cast out of the garden. Now we get to go back into the garden. But listen to what he says. He says, those that have purified themselves, those that have consecrated themselves. Why? Because they want to go into heaven. He goes, guess what? Following one who is among those who eat the flesh of pigs, rats, and other clean thing, unclean things, they will meet their end together with the one they follow, declares the Lord. In other words, he says, you Christians, you followers of God, that jump into the cesspool of those who do not know God, who act like those who do not know God, guess what? You too will perish. Whoa. <laughs> um, you know, this is, uh, this is scary and incredibly convicting. Jesus is quoting from Isaiah 66, and he's letting the folks know in his modern day, let me tell you something. Even the people of God, if you decide to follow the way the world acts, when judgment comes down, you too will perish with the worldly. And this is why Jesus is so strong on, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If your feet rush into judgment or rush into destruction, cut them off. If your eye, your perspective, how you view things causes you to sin, gouge it out. Why? He's warning. Don't become like the world. Don't follow into its behavior and its actions. For if you do, you will follow it into eternal destruction. Well, what, what's my conclusion? You know, there's a couple things. One, be sure to taste your words before you spit them out. <laughs> For that hand, click send or click post. Make sure you wrestle with God on what you're saying and how you're saying. You know, Jesus says in the Gospels, the Father has told me what to say and how to say it. Before you click send, wrestle with God on what to say and how you say it. You know, the next one is who you follow. Who do your feet follow? You know, everybody's always like, comment, like, share, and subscribe. Comment, like, share, and subscribe, right? Well, who are you following? Who are you liking? How, what are your comments like? You know, who, your feet, what are they following? What, what direction are they going? We have to be careful. We are not our own. I no longer live. But Christ lives in me. A third conclusion, your perspective. You know, you got to be a lot more self-aware as a Christian. Understanding who you are. You know, there are a number of circumstances that come up in the church, and I, I speak to Walter and others at different times, and I say, you know what, I'm not the best person to engage in that conversation. <laughs> Why? Because I know the backside of my apple has got all kinds of chew marks in it. Uh, the backside of my apple sometimes is even rotten. And despite what's on the front that seems like it can go in and engage in certain things, the backside is saying something different. I've got to be self-aware 
about my, my weaknesses, my tendencies, my biases, and I can't allow that um, to, to motivate me to gain, uh, engage, uh, engage in conversation, and I know it's just not healthy. And I've got to step back and go, yeah, I may feel something strongly, but I know my weakness. I've got to know, I've got to be a whole lot more self-aware. Why? Because Jesus says, guess what? You cause somebody to struggle, you're going to be in trouble. And I've I got to humble myself before God, despite how I feel, despite what convictions I may have. God comes first. And I've got to allow people to shape and form who I am before I engage in things that I'm not quite sure about, even if I'm convinced of, about certain things. What do I know I need to do? I need to be about God's work. I got a photo of this gentleman. His name is Vincent Hyatt. Vincent is the brother of our dear sister, Dr. Vanetta Hyatt, uh, who is a phenomenal, faithful sister in our church. Well, this is her brother. Her brother has been battling cancer and uh, currently is on hospice care. And a uh, really, really difficult physical situation, but he's fighting uh, for his life. Well, last week, Wednesday, I had the honor and privilege, along with Charles Foy, to baptize Vincent. This is your brother in Christ. You know, back in December, we got the opportunity to first talk with Vincent about studying the Bible. And uh, my first conversation with him, I said, Vincent, I said, uh, Hey, man, I, you know, I'm a minister, and da da da. He said, Oh, yeah, I remember I had come out, you know, a few years back. And I said, Well, we're going to sit down, and I would love to study the Bible with you. And he said, Yeah, well, let's do that. And I said, Well, you know, as far as your faith, what, what do you want? What do you, this is our first conversation. He said to me, He said, You know, Chip, I just want God to forgive me of all of my sin. <laughs> I mean, I just. <laughs> I mean, that was just like, wow. I mean, I was like, are you kidding me? Hey, man, I'm in the business of teaching people about God's forgiveness. Let's do it. And we studied the Bible pretty much every day, every other day, depending on his health. There were some days he just couldn't do anything. All the way through the holidays. Uh, and last Wednesday, your your brother now, Vincent, was baptized. And, uh, you know, it's interesting. When we got together... We never talked about social issues. <laughs> we never talked about politics. We didn't talk about anything other than God's perspective on forgiveness. You see, Vincent understood what was important. And we engaged in studying the Bible, and Vincent got baptized. We got, you know, because of his situation, we had to go find a literally almost a hundred gallon trash can, brand new, and we brought it up, we filled that thing up with buckets, and we, we carried him on into it, uh, you know, and he, he went down, and I thought we were going to harm him putting him down, we got him out, and he sat in that bed and just smiles on smiles on smiles, <laughs> the joy that was within him. It, it totally, it was more powerful than any illness he had, any weakness he had. Why? He had found God. He had found God. He was assured of his inheritance with God because of Jesus. He wasn't happy because we had this debate about some social issue and he won the debate. He was joyful that God was forgiving him of all of his sins. Brothers and sisters, let's be men and women that reflect the image of God. Let's be brothers and sisters that are all about God's purposes. And yes, we face many challenges in our society. We see many ills in our society. But we must be convinced that the answer, that the answer to this is the Lordship of Christ. Brothers and sisters, I love you. Meditate on these words, and I pray that God will bless your life. Thank you. Thanks, Chip, for a great message today. Hey, everyone. At this time, we're going...